Mm -hmm. um, for for the invitation and and today um, what I want to do is is draw upon excerpts from my newest book um, Empire of Rubber Firestone Scramble for Land and Power in Liberia and I'll intersperse that with uh, interludes to pull out some of the larger themes and issues that the book addresses, which are at the intersections of environmental history, the history of science and medicine, and the environmental humanities. So I'm um, just going to pause here a minute and move to sharing my screen. Um, okay, and can everybody see that okay? Yes. Good, great. So to begin, rubber is the most important commodity in the world, Harvey Firestone, president of the Rubber Association of America, declared to the association's more than 600 member and guests at New York City's Waldorf Astoria Hotel for an annual meeting in 1917. And this is a photo um, on uh, the, the man with the um, uh, cap uh, with the mustache is Harvey Firestone. Uh, in the middle is Thomas Edison, and uh, next to him on Edison's right is uh, an American naturalist, John Burroughs. Um, and they, they went on these celebrated camping trips in the 19-teens and 20s that were much covered by the American press, along with Henry Ford. Many industry executives dressed in black tuxes and white bow ties laughed at such an audacious claim as they feasted upon oysters, squab, bisque glace, and wine. The 48-year-old Firestone was dead serious. The grand ballroom in which guests dined and where he delivered his remarks was decorated for the occasion with a lavish patriotic display of draped American flags. William Howard Taft, another famed Ohioan, was the guest of honor that evening. At 350 pounds, he was a giant of a man. Moreover, Taft, who became the first governor general of the Philippines under American occupation in 1901 and served as president of the United States from 1909 to 1913, had no qualms about throwing around the weight of private capital and government to gain economic and political advantage for American firms in foreign lands. Taft's efforts to build a civilian government in the Philippines, and in particular, to secure a place for American capital where the rubber industry might, in his words, grow and produce its rubber under the American flag was welcomed with applause by the dinner guests. Noting that the United States consumed 60% of all crude rubber in the world, Taft reminded the attendees of, quote, the awkwardness of being without a supply of rubber. The increase in the demand for rubber, he observed, emphasizes our greater dependence upon tropical products and the greater necessity for the improvement of conditions of life and business and government in tropical countries. Firestone couldn't have asked for a speech more in keeping with where his own thoughts had begun to turn. Um, and this is a, an, an image of the a Firestone Tire and Rubber Company plant in Akron um, in the in the 1920s, um, at a moment when when these conversations uh, were happening about um, what was then British control of the world's rubber supply, so opens the first chapter of Empire of Rubber. The book offers a story of how a behemoth American company on a nationalist mission of profit, robed in beneficence, negotiated, maneuvered, and bullied its way into what was then one of only two sovereign Black nations on the African continent. Stepping outside America helps to make visible the structures of white privilege and power buttressed by science and medicine that drove the march of American capitalism and empire across the globe. But the story of Firestone in Liberia is more than a story of the white supremacy and racial capitalism that powered an American family dynasty for more than half a century. It is also a history of contestation, complicity, and resistance. The leaders of a struggling Black Republic maneuvered to hold their ground to save Liberia from becoming an American protectorate. 
And this is Edwin uh, Barclay, who was president of Liberia from 1930 to 1943, who was a masterful diplomat and politician and successfully um, thwarted efforts for five years um, when the, uh, there was a League of Nations investigation into slavery and forced labor in Liberia from 1930 to 1935, which Firestone was using to try and turn Liberia into an American protectorate. And this is a, a map of West Africa in the 1920s. And, and you see the vulnerable position that Liberia was in. Um, it's surrounded by uh, British and French colonial holdings, um, which were always eating away at its territory. Um, and so it was in desperate need of, of capital um, and foreign um, uh, political uh, power to, to help protect its, its sovereignty. From across the African diaspora, Black activists, writers, scientists, diplomats, and business people rallied to support or oppose the experiment that was Firestone in Liberia. Could the plantation free itself from the violence of land dispossession, racial exploitation, and unfree labor that shaped its history in the Atlantic world? Could American capital be trusted to respect the rights of a sovereign Black nation and its people in an imperial and colonial world? Would Firestone prove to be an angel or a devil to Liberia? Such questions swirled around the promise Harvey Firestone made to build in Liberia a modern industrial plantation that would bring, in his words, great benefits to the country and its people. These questions remain today. So you might ask, why, why Firestone? Why focus on Firestone? In exploring the role of science, medicine, and disease in the making of an industrial landscape, I used the Firestone rubber plantations in Liberia to query and push on some historiographic themes, theoretical issues, and analytical tools at the intersections of environmental history, the history of science and medicine, and the environmental humanities more generally. First is the generic use of the term ecology within environmental humanities, such that it has virtually no meaning other than relationality. Long ago, Donna Haraway pointed out the emergence of ecosystem ecology as a war baby. I saw the Firestone plantations as an opportunity to similarly interrogate how disease ecology, at least in the American strand of such work, had its genealogy in the biomedical research and work that took place on industrial plantations being forged through the global reach of American capital and empire. Second, if environmental history is a project in understanding how new worlds are made, then we need to shift our attention, I would suggest, away from the state, which has dominated much scholarship in the field, to a consideration of the corporation, which has been the primary makers of worlds for much of the 20th and all the 21st century. And we need to ask how science and medicine have been integral to the making of these engineered worlds in the mine, on the plantation, and in the factory. Third, I've been increasingly concerned with the relative absence of race as an analytic category in environmental history, as well as the whiteness of the field. What productive dialogues might be forged across environmental history, history of science and medicine, and critical Black studies? The granting of a million acres of land for a 99 year concession to Firestone by a struggling Black Republic occupied considerable controversy and debate among Black writers, businessmen, politicians, and scientists across the African diaspora in the first half of the 20th century. And it offers an opportunity to explore the diverse ways in which the natural and social sciences were being appropriated and used by Black intellectuals in Africa and across the diaspora in articulating different visions of development. People like W.E.B. Du Bois, who was at first actually supportive of, the, of Firestone um, in Liberia and then came to have a change in heart and became one of Vi Firestone's most vocal critics until his death in 1963. Or people like George Brown, who got his training um, at Howard University under uh, Carter Woodson, who um, was a, a pioneer in the development of um, African-American history, and then would go on to get his 
um, PhD from the London School of Economics, where he studied um, different, the economic history um, and land tenure systems in Liberia, who also became a, a critique of Firestone. Or people like Frank Pinder, who was an agricultural economist trained at Florida A&M University, worked for the US Farm Security Administration during the Great Depression, helping black sharecroppers in the South develop markets for their products, and then spent 10 years in Liberia, um, vehemently opposed to the plantation economy that Firestone developed and working with small shareholders in Liberia, sensitive to uh, farming traditions and, and uh, cultural traditions in West Africa, helping them develop markets, um, international markets for their produce. All of these um, are uh, important figures in the book. Land dispossession is always the first act in the making of a plantation world. Almost 100 years ago, Firestone Tire and Rubber Company secured a major land concession in Liberia to build a vast rubber plantation. Eager to break the British stranglehold on the world's rubber supply, Harvey's Firestone looked to the tiny West African nation, founded in 1847 as a sovereign Black Republic, to realize his dreams of achieving American rubber independence. Harbel, situated 40 miles southeast of the capital city of Monrovia, in an area encircled by the Dew, Junk, and Farmington rivers, was ground central for the Firestone Plantations Company, now Firestone Liberia. The area was originally home to the Basa people, whose customary lands were claimed as public land by the Liberia government and ceded to a foreign company in the hopes of securing desperately needed capital for a struggling Black Republic. Technically, the Firestone Agreements excluded tribal reserves of land set aside for the communal use of any tribe within the Republic of Liberia. But the government ran roughshod over customary land claims, rendering such a clause meaningless. Stories of Firestone's initial dispossession abound. A spry old man from Suwakoko who worked on and off the plantations dating back to when Edwin Barclay, president from 1934, 1930 to 1944 was in the chair, told how and he and other Pele men would tease Basso workers for trading their land to Firestone for salt and fish. But Pele people also suffered from acts of dispossession and closure that followed with the introduction of rubber to Liberia's economy. As one Pele elder referring to rubber remarked, and I quote, it came from the hands of the Kui people. They brought it here. It is what has broken our land. In Kuiza, the memory of displacement in the making of a plantation world haunts the stories told about the past. And I want to show a, a brief a video clip taken in Kuiza that comes from a film we made on history, memory, and land rights in Liberia uh, called The Land Beneath Our Feet. Sweet. <laughs> This, uh, this was a quarter of a in a little bit in the past of time. เดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี
ุทธาเนี่ยเรื่องนวัสดุการเชื่อนวัสดุก็ตามมาเชื่อมเรื่องเวลาจะหรือว่าที่ว่าที่เนี่ยเว้นว่าคุณนวัสดุ So you see how this very place name Quiza, right, is is a, as an inscription of of the act of land dispossession um, that went on with uh, the Firestone Concession. Other place names similarly recall the violence of land seizure. Firestone's clearing of land that became Division Twenty Two required torching thousands of acres of cut wood desiccated in the intense heat of Liberia's dry season. Oh, sorry. And this is a, a, a photo, an example of the fires that, that Firestone would set. You can see, you can see the scale of these because you can see there's a little house, um, you know, within that picture. Firestone took care to notify town chiefs and nearby villages that they would assume no responsibility for losses incurred by fires that got out of their control. Elders suggest that these fires are the origins of Wolowini a name that refers to a part of Division 22 and means baboon burning. As recounted by a second generation Firestone worker whose father came in 1926 to work on the plantations, people refused to move, so the whole area got burned. So the people that got burned, they named them Wolo, baboon. Violence endured by local people extended beyond the immediate loss of land and life. The making of the Firestone Plantations also cut ancestral ties to the land. Esther Warner, an American artist and novelist whose husband headed in the Botanical Research Division of the Firestone Plantations, told the story of Abasa chief Kandia, with whom she studied West African wood carving traditions. His village was marked for demolition. First, the village coffee trees, which signified a customary claim to land, were first felled. It was a sign the plantation people would soon come, break his roots, and force him to go across the river, Warner learned. Kandia did not want to leave his fathers long since dead, who moved among the forest trees encircling the village. But the Fantir Four soldiers came, destroyed the village, and Kandia soon died. The planting of tree crops is recognized among Liberia's rural people as a means to secure land tenure. This destruction of these crops by multinationals is a practice repeated up to the present day in Liberia. Tree crops, including cacao, cola, orange, and rubber, along with the majestic and sacred seba or cotton tree, physically substantiate in the land, both the memory of ancestral occupation and the powers and benefits associated with land held in common. Their physical destruction is an important act in dispossession. It is a physical erasure of past labor sedimented in the land. It is a quote, material colonial inscription, here enacted by forms of racial capitalism in which a comprador Liberian elite beholden to the inequitable and violent structures of white capital for their nation's continued sovereignty, aided in cutting, in Catherine Yusuf's words, geographical ties to the land and attachments to ecologies. The process of creative destruction that Firestone claimed transformed unproductive wasteland into a profitable industrial plantation, not only displaced local inhabitants. It also relied upon indigenous knowledge and gender divisions of labor embodied in sweat and agricultural practices throughout Liberia to build a new world. Among the Pele people, the ethnic group employed in the largest number on the Firestone plantations, Liberia's dry and wet seasons define the rhythm of life in making farms and livelihoods in the country's interior. During the dry season from mid-December to mid-April, men clear the forest, fell the trees, burn the farm, and clear debris. These were the months when worker shortages were greatest on the plantations. The need for male labor making farms far outweighed whatever monetary benefits accrued tapping rubber. With the land cleared, women planted upland rice, usually from May to June, the beginning of the rainy season. The weeding care and harvesting of rice is traditionally done by women. 
as it is the growing of cassava, swamp rice, peppers, okra, and other crops. Cash crops grown by women and sold at market are one means of empowerment for women in a patrilineal society where access to land today is still controlled largely by men. Firestone adopted the same slash and burn methods in transforming the rainforest into a profit-yielding monoculture rubber plantation. Men were contracted to fell by ax giant trees, some up to four feet in diameter, burn the massive dry forests and clear the land. Tapping, which Firestone considered unskilled labor, but which in fact depends upon craft knowledge to prevent damage to the tree was also reserved for men. As women came to be employed on the plantations, they first found employment in the nursery farms, bringing their skills in cultivating crops to bear in the germination and nurturing of rubber seedlings. And this continues on to this day. This is a photo I took um, on the Firestone plantations about 10 years ago. The rainy season was the, the planting of bud grafted trees also became part of women's work on the plantations. The rainy season was planting time on the plantations as it was upcountry. Each day, a group of women working under a headman would be given from four to six bundles, 25 rubber stumps in a bundle, and assigned a clear cleared area to plant. It was laborious and careful work, supervised by white managers who would suspend or fire someone if the rows were not straight or the trees planted were, were planted too closely. Bonds were forged among women, work crews, reflective of cue of communal farming practices back home, who worked under group contracts for Firestone. Fast planters came to the aid of slower ones. If you are strong, one retired woman recalled, you will leave your friends behind and finish soon. If you are slow, your friends will help you to plant your remaining stumps before you can go home. Mutual aid among women laborers ensured the contract was met and helped to nurture tree crops. Other women expressed pride in nurturing and care of seedlings now matured into productive trees, much like they would speak of the crash crops they grew on their individual farms back home. Most of the trumper trees you see, my handwork is on many, one retired woman proudly explains to me. World War II proved a boon to the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company as its rubber plantations in Liberia took on strategic importance in a world at war. And this is a photo in, taken in 1943 of Franklin Delano Roosevelt seated with Charles, seated with Edwin Barclay um, in Liberia. It's the first time that a sitting pres US president stepped foot on African soil and signifies the importance that Liberia held uh, the strategic importance that Liberia held for the U.S. during the Second World War. When, in December of 1941, the Japanese military bombed Pearl Harbor and began its sweep across the Malay Peninsula, the United States' worst fears were realized. In a matter of weeks, a region that supplied 90% of the world's natural rubber supply had fallen to the Axis powers. Suddenly, Liberia, one of the remaining strongholds of Allied natural rubber production became critical to the American economic and military interests. Wartime rubber shortages demanded faster production both on the plantations and in American factories. In 1941, Firestone Liberia's plantations yielded 9,000 tons of rubber, representing an almost tenfold increase in production in six years but it met a fraction of America's wartime rubber needs, estimated at 600,000 tons annually. The crisis spurred a coordinated concerted effort across American industry, government, and academia to meet the present presenting shortfall rivaled only um, by the uh, Manhattan Project for the making of the atomic bomb. Thousands of industrial chemists and engineers, dozens of government agencies, and a host of companies, industrial laboratories, and research universities set a goal in 1942 to ramp up annual output of synthetic rubber, which in 1941 amounted to a mere 231 tons, to increase that to 700,000 tons per year. Plantation factories rose like magic mushrooms out of the earth, Harvey Firestone Jr. told the Saturday Evening Post in 1944. 
But the rubber these plantation factories produced was not by way of the tree heavy of Brazilians. Rather, the wonders of chemistry and the $700 million government investment in the alchemical forges of the petroleum and rubber industries had by early 1942 developed a recipe for synthetic rubber. GRS rubber, as it was known, was made of a mix of butadiene and styrene, organic chemical compounds toxic to human health derived from byproducts of the oil refining industry. In April of 1942, the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company boasted production of the first bale of GRS rubber. Within a matter of months, Goodrich, Goodyear, and United, and United States rubber had followed suit. In 1945, the four American companies, once completely at the mercy of British and Dutch rubber plantations, had come close to achieving their wartime goal, manufacturing 547,000 tons of synthetic rubber. But the development of synthetic rubber did not spell the end of Firestone's Liberian plantations. Instead, the research and innovation propelled by wartime needs sped up production and increased yields of natural rubber, maximized human labor, and decreased costs. Transformations in natural rubber cultivation were like that of synthetic rubber, a feat of scientific research, industrial engineering, and corporate management. The industrial ecologies that arose in wartime on Firestone's Liberia plantations reshaped life in the region and on the plantations themselves that endured long after the Second World War. Wartime demands for rubber helped to lock in place a set of relationships between Liberia and the United States, between white managers and black laborers, and between humans and the natural environment in this small West African nation that had emerged as a pivotal place in the wartime global economy. The intimate relations forged on the plantations among people, trees, parasites, chemicals, and machines brought benefits and burdens that differentially affected lives in ways that reveal the racial logics and values of Firestone's corporate culture. Firestone sold itself on a promise of benevolence to Liberia, but life and work on the plantations was highly segregated by race. At its peak in the late 1940s, the Firestone plantations employed approximately 30,000 Liberians, the majority of whom were tappers, earning 18 cents per day, supervised by roughly 125 white managers. And at the time, um, the Firestone plantations were the most prof profitable subsidiary of the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company. The racial geographies visible on a nearly 200 square mile enclave and embedded in the structure and management of the plantation workforce were greatly sh shaped by the racial attitudes of an American company and its company town. Akron, the center of American rubber manufacturing was one of the largest centers of the Ku Klux Klan north of the Mason-Dixon line. On the Firestone plantations in Liberia, White management performed minstrel shows in blackface at the whites only Firestone Staff Club. This is the golf course behind the Firestone Staff Club in Liberia. Housing and healthcare for white management. This was white management housing and black laborers. This is uh, Liberian housing was segregated. Medical surveillance of and drug testing on workers' bodies was routine. Such conditions reinforced the impression of African-American Edwin Dip Ed diplomat Edward Dudley in 1951 that Firestone was, quote, transferring U.S. Jim Crow policies to Liberia. Tappers are the lifeblood of any rubber plantation. Without their valuable skill, knowledge, and labor, latex will not flow. The task structured a tapper's day. It set the average quota of work expected of each man. Tasking had a long history. When cotton was king in the American South, plantation owners used it to organize the work and calculate the value of enslaved people. In the early 20th century, the task became a defining element of modern scientific management in industrial factories. In the tire building rooms of Firestone's factories, and particularly on its rubber plantations, 
the task took on ever greater scientific precision. The task for a tapper set throughout the 1940s and 1950s, when Harvey Firestone Jr. commanded Firestone's rubber empire, averaged 300 trees per day. An intimate relation was forged between tapper and tree. A tree tapped with attention and care could yield latex for up to 25 years. With utmost skill, the tapper sliced a shallow cut, less than 1 16th of an inch wide into the bark of a tree. The cut, which ran from left to right at an angle of 30 degrees, and you can see those markings here, sever, was set to maximize the number of severed latex vessels, and it was a controlled wound of the tree. Cuts mimicked the harm caused by insects and thereby stimulated the plant to release its insect defense, which manifests as latex, a hydrocarbon contained in specialized cells just beneath the outer bark. A cut any wider than 1 16th of an inch wasted the tree's energies, regenerating bark. A cut any deeper than one millimeter risked injuring the vital xylem and phloem, the tree's transport highway that carries water, minerals, and sugars where they are needed. A wound too wide or deep, and the tapper could shorten the life of the rubber tree. Firestone invested more in the life of the tree than that of a tapper. It didn't take too many deep wounds before a tapper found himself without a job. In the transformation of land and ecological relations that built and sustained plantation worlds, Firestone exacerbated certain disease risks and introduced new harms. The making of an industrial landscape was fraught with worker risks, the clearing of land, the recruitment of human labor, and the destruction of flora and fauna opened up possibilities for opportunistic insects, along with parasites they carried to thrive. The human loving fly, black fly, Similium yahense was one. The waterways, critical to the plantation's infrastructure, along with wind breaks and shade furnished by monoculture rubber forests, offered an ideal habitat for the biting black fly. Most active in the morning when tappers were at work, the fly found an abundance of human meals on the plantation. As black flies and people moved to the plantation, they brought along a fellow traveler, the parasitic worm, Oncocircal volvulus, like its insect vesper, flourished in the ecological conditions of the rubber plantations. Transmitted to its human host via the black fly, the parasite is one of the leading causes of blindness in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the tropical world. On the divisions along the Dude River, onchocerciasis or river blindness became much more prevalent than elsewhere in Liberia. 60 years after the first divisions were cleared on the Firestone plantations, the presence of the parasite among male laborers living near the Dew River averaged nearly 80%. Chemicals that periflated throughout the plantation complex were another health risk. Chemicals like ammonia were vital to the operation of the plantation. Ammonia, a constant companion in the life of a tapper, was critical to keeping latex in its liquid state. Yet tappers used the chemical without gloves or protective eye gear. It saturated the pores of a tapper's hand, deadened fingertips, and destroyed fingernails. Once they filled your ammonia bottle, one tapper recalled, you had to close it quickly or it may waste on you and burn your skin. Some went blind when the corrosive and caustic chemical got in their eyes. When it flashed in your eye, it spoiled, the bay said. If it is all two of your eyes, it will spoil it. Many other hazardous chemicals came onto the Firestone plantations in the post-war years. The Second World War had spawned an abundance of new chemical compounds. With them came grand schemes for large-scale industrial agriculture, green revolutions, and feeding a hungry world. Laborers sprayed 245T on old rubber trees. Then tractors cleared the dead, defoiled vegetation, a way to make room for new plantings of rubber tree seedlings. The herbicide had other beneficial effects. It leached into the soil and killed fungi responsible for root rot, a major disease 
that threaten the health and productivity of Firestone's River trees. But the herbicide contains small amounts of a highly toxic environmental pollutant, dioxin. Scientists paid no attention to the chemical's possible health effects on workers or on communities living downstream from the Harmel plantations along the Doom and Farmington rivers. And this is the main uh, factory, and you see the river behind it, the Farmington River, where Firestone um, just would dump all uh, its chemical waste and would go downstream. Little was natural about the production of natural rubber in the post-war years. Firestone laborers lived and worked in a plantation world, teeming with biological, chemical, and physical risks. During the war years, lawsuits against the company brought by by Liberian workers became more common. In response to increased pressure by the Liberian government, Firestone put a worker compensation policy in place. But its death benefit came nowhere close to the damage that families of Firestone workers who died on the job sought. In 1946, a tapper's life was valued by Firestone at $252, $3,348 today, provided the cause of death was not worker negligence. A foot amounted to compensation of $126. A hand was worth 700 times a worker's wages, and I 654 times when a tapper earned 18 cents per day. In the calculus of workers' compensation, Firestone disclosed the value it placed on the lives of black laborers in the Jim Crow era in the Jim Crow enclave it had imported to Liberia. It was a valuation founded upon structures of racial capitalism rooted in the violent and bloody soil of plantation slavery. Firestone touted its Liberia plantations as an exemplar of modern industry and progress, buttressed by the transformative power and humanitarian benefits of American science and medicine. But it, it segregated an unequal treatment of white and black workers, support of racist science and medicine, an extraction and export of wealth amassed from confiscated lands, fire standards shared more in common with past plantation worlds than it stood apart from them. And now just to conclude. In a 2013 report published by the US National Academy of Sciences, the authors described the wave of transnational land acquisitions over the last decade by foreign investors in Sub-Saharan Africa and other regions across the globe as a new form of colonialism. The case of land grabs in Liberia raises the question, what is new? As Charlene Milet argues, and I quote, land grabbing can only be conceptualized as new or novel if scholars continue to ignore enduring racial logics and accompanying racial discourses embedded in natural resource conflicts. The racial logics of capital, whereby the making of racial difference and land and labor justified Western exploitation and economic domination of regions like Liberia reveal themselves time and again in the sedimentary histories of land concessions brokered by corporate empires like Firestone and settler elites in need of capital and territory to protect Liberia's sovereignty as a nation from the imposing imperial powers of Great Britain and France, whose colonies bordered the nation. Such agreements have been transformative of the social life of land in Liberia. They concentrated power in an oligarchy, exacerbated inequality, and planted the seeds of discontent and revolution among the country's plantation laborers and subsistence farmers, increasingly dispossessed of land upon which livelihoods were and still are being made. The land and surrounding infrastructure of the Firestone Plantation Complex bears witness to storied layers of land dispossession and destruction, promises made and broken, growth without development, and the extractive nature of plantation economies. Um, this is a, a photo of a, a recent concession, uh, some Darby concession. It's an oil pump concession of a half a million acres of land that was built on a former rubber concession of, of BF Goodrich. And in 2018, 50% of Liberia's land 
uh, is tie has been tied up in these kinds of land concessions, which go back to the history of Firestone. But as you drive along the 40 mile stretch of highway from Harbell, the center of Firestone's operations to Monrovia, you will see plots everywhere of half built cinder block homes, of gardens with peppers, pineapple, or potato greens, of planted tree crops such as palm, papaya, banana, and coconut. Such plots stand in contrast to the plantation, and here I'm drawing upon Sylvia Winter's work. These are plantings in keeping with customary rights to land, use rights that secure tenure, however ephemeral, in defiance of legal definitions of private property that several elites and multinationals in the past have sought to impose. In 2018, the Liberian legislature passed the Land Rights Act, which for the first time in Liberia's history, gives legal rights and protection to the majority of Liberia's citizens who live in areas rural areas and own their lands collectively according to customary laws. Whether Liberian law will now stand beside, behind such acts of cultivation remains to be seen. Regardless, the planting and cultivation of subsistence and cash crops on whatever small plots of land can be claimed will continue with or without the backing of the state. Of this, one can be sure. Land is life in Liberia. Access to it will not be, nor has it ever been, surrendered easily. Thank you. <laughs>